us. Hi. Oh, sorry, quite loud. We're not used to these handheld mics. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Kinvara, and this is Zach Posen. Hello. And we've just had a quick meet and greet on the stairs because uh, he only just got here. Okay. <laughs> so before we start the talk, we're just going to take a look at a little film. Absolutely. And then we're going to get talking. Thank you for all coming today. Yeah. Okay, I will just I will just clarify that within that what we've seen this that is the labels that you designed for which we're going to talk about is Zach Posen, Zach Zach Posen, Brooks Brothers, some David's Bridal, and there was one more that I've just forgot. Delta. Delta. Airlines. Yeah, airlines, and then there was something else. This is what he does. He does a lot of things, so we have a lot to talk about. TV. So I think what we should do is just talk a little bit about how you started, because I know that some of your training began in London, it and did. I think that's fantastic, and you were at Central St. Martin's, which was St. Martin's in that day. Absolutely. So can you just tell us a little bit about that time before Absolutely. we talk about now? Well, uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, London is a place that I actually, I never expected to leave. I thought I would live here forever. And I think you would do very, you would go down very well here. I had here. a lot of fun here. Um, so I applied to Central St. Martin's and to the foundation and to the main women's uh, BA program honors and I got accepted to both and I decided to go right into the main program. It was just turned 18 and... Uh, Did you always, were you always wanting to be a fashion designer no. from an early age? No, I wanted to be a baker, which has come back into my life. <laughs> I wanted to be a performer. Uh, and then my voice changed from being a tenor to a baritone, but I sang till I was 18 uh, and did, you know, dance and, and all of that jazz. And, um, but at 16, my mom said, get a job. No more summer camp, which we go to in, in the States. And uh, I said, well, I want to work in fashion. And I had been sketching clothing since I was a very little boy, probably more organized then I became later, like I would do knit collections, and, and my father is an artist and a painter, so the creative process was always uh, supported, encouraged, and revered in my household. Um, anyhow, fast forward. I came to London at, at 18 and immersed myself into British culture. Uh, I met incredible friends uh, through my journey here. When I started at 16 in fashion, I had met 
uh, some of the incredible British, now iconic supermodels that were my first clients. So I remember making, uh, when I was 16, Karen Elson, like a voile dress with like uh, little tufts on it. And you know, then Erin O'Connor might want a piece and then a Jade Parfit. And, and then I met uh, Iris Palmer and I fell in love with her. It was sort of my first real girl crush and I just thought she was really uh, mysterious and aloof. Eccentric. And eccentric. <laughs> and, um, you know, I knew I wanted to come to the UK. But how, how did you meet all those people? Because I know a lot of people do land in London and they don't. I, was this through Isabella Blow? Were you friends with Izzy? I was friends with Izzy, but I met Izzy on my first large-scale fashion show. I think it was her last New York Fashion Week. But I didn't meet them through Izzy. I think I met them, well, I met them working on fashion shows in New York. And, and just kind of, they were all living in New York at that time. And I think I was probably going out a lot and pretty ambitious. And, you know, it wasn't targeted. I was just drawn to these uh, incredible, inspiring women. And it was a time in fashion when these, I would say, great characters were allowed to be characters. And I was really drawn to that. I was drawn to the romantic period within fashion that they were part of. Uh, and then I met uh, a young feller named Dan McMillan, who was also pretty, uh, yeah. you know, alluring. And I just, I knew I wanted to come here and see what that was about. And, and those are the people that I think intrigued me. And I also was interning at the Costume Institute. And during that period of time, so from 96 to 98, really was a changing moment in fashion when uh, the great designers as, as Alexander McQueen and John Galliano were really coming into the forefront. They had changed fashion and the modern day luxury brand was built around their unparalleled, incredible deep imaginations and theatricality. And that was something that I was very drawn to and I had the experience of you know watching them work in the library at the Met and assisting them, uh, yeah, it was quite you know. And I, I remember being taken to lunch with John and his team, and being terrified and petrified. And um, you know, I'll never remember his muse at the time walking down the hallway, and she was wearing a muslin of one of his famous bias cut dresses and a heathered gray jersey. She had Princess Leia buns. And literally within a span, went into like five languages. And I thought, that's what amuses. Wow, you know, it was, yeah. it was incredible. Anyhow, so I came here, I moved into a basement apartment in Bloomsbury that was haunted. <laughs> it was haunted, for real. I mean, it was, I remember, uh, it was a publishing house, and, and I lived in the basement, and uh, I moved in with a young lady named Jessica Jaffe, who I'd met that summer in a nightclub. And I was Wait, doing no, my fittings fifth, on her. You're the fifth guest, I've said this in my talks. Every time I interviewed Patrick Cox, Sandy Powell, Mary Catranzo, they all met their first friend in fashion or their big break in a nightclub. I spotted her. I mean, right. I think I thought it was Nicole Kidman. She was very <laughs> fiery red hair. Anyhow, we moved in together and I was making clothing and she had gone to a, uh, kind of similar type of high school that I went to. So she went to a school called b -Dales. And uh, so I got you know, introduced into you know, her friends from that school. Um, and then I had my life at, at St. Martin's, which you know, at the time I don't think I enjoyed very much at school. Not that there were classes, because it's really project and critique and working with your pattern making tutors, which were you know, which was probably the greatest experience. But what, what was incredible and very prepar preparatory for fashion was how strict and cruel at moments, you know, and harsh it could be. And do you think that was St. Martin's or do you think that's quite a British thing? I think it's both. Okay. <laughs> I think it's both. I mean, yeah. graded on the curve from, you know, from an experience of a very progressive New York City school in Brooklyn Heights that didn't give grades. 
Uh, it was quite, you know. And, and who were your peer, Who were some of your peers? What have they gone on to do? Well, the first person that I spotted at school was uh, a very talented lady named Natalie Ratabasi. Natalie Ratabasi has gone on not into her own brand, but she is one of the, you know, I'd say handful of fashion ninjas in the industry. Uh, they were very harsh with her at school, and I did not understand. I thought there is this incredibly beautiful Italian girl who can draw like nothing I have ever seen to date and, and had taste and could make clothing. So I kind of, you know, that's who I was like. I zoomed towards, and I had an incredible tutor, uh, Howard Tange, and he was our illustration tutor, and, you know, I think he, you know, he kind of laser-focused. You know, and I think he reminded me of my father, uh, and uh, you know, I was quite intimidated. He did beautiful, some of my favorite, beautiful illustrations of me when I was at school there, and uh, incredible pattern making teachers. Um, yeah, it was it was an amazing, competitive, incredible environment. Um, and then I met two people, two young ladies here, Poppy and Daisy Devilnov, and their mother Jan. And Jan originally was American, and, and she had been, has, is still an incredible model her entire lifespan. And I got introduced to really, you know, the work of Jean Muir and Ozzie Clark. And what we have to remember is this is pre-internet. So if you were interested in a topic into fashion, you really had to research it. And if there wasn't a book, you'd have to kind of piece together the story. Fashion was, had not become fashion-tainment in the way that it is today or a, an online medium. Which I really want to talk about as well because you've embraced that and worked that so well and that's also, but it's because well, I like process the and the research. Before. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, it was, you know, I feel like I got an amazing experience because I was able to see so many different sides. West London, you're on your phone already. You're like, time, time, time. I'm checking the time because there was so Anyhow, much to talk about. You know, I haunted we Portobello have to talk Road. About tech. I then, I'm trying to think of great London memories. I then later lived with a photographer, Vanina Sorrenti, who had just moved here and was shooting for ID and British Vogue and was very immersed into the Dazed and Confused scene. And Jefferson Hack, you know, became a very good friend. And so I saw, you know, that East London scene and immersed myself. I mean, I must have had a lot of energy. It must have been well, going out say, every single right. night. So were you, were you... My parents thought I was on drugs because it's so expensive here. <laughs> and I would say, I'm buying fabrics and coffee and books and so many books at the discount bookstores. So were you in the studio, you were in the studio in the day and then in the night you kind of nightclubbing, partying, Well, you'd get your assignment. And, uh, and then from there, I, you know, I'd spend time in the library and very little time because you had to compete for space at the school at the time, and it was so competitive. I remember you couldn't leave stuff in a locker, it would disappear. Really? Very, well, your you know, stuff, maybe. Everybody, it was very competitive. Somebody would chop it or something, you know, but it was, it was, so this was good training. Um, it clearly served you really well because you've had a serious career and serious longevity because as we know, a lot of people go through those paces and don't actually last yeah. the distance. So if we fast forward to from there, Via Parsons, which was before or after St. Martin's? Parsons was when I was in high school. Right. Parsons was at 16. Okay. I don't consider that really part of my education. Okay. I had to lose everything I learned at Parsons. Okay, that's fun. Okay, For, you know, I don't believe in fashion formula at all. So I remember coming home and all of a sudden, my, you know, having these illustrations and these rules, like a fashion body needs to be 10 heads tall. And my feminist mother and sister, I think, were horrified. My artist father... You know, it was just, you know, in kind of shock at like these systems of this is how you draw an eyebrow or this is how you draw a nose and this is not how they thought, you know, creativity worked. This was Quite about right. creating creativity into an industry or a system. Okay, so we... So no Parsons. There was okay, Parsons, no Parsons, I was like a baby. No Parsons, no different system. Different summer, different, different... So fast Summer forward, at 16 in New York. Fast forward all this training to... 2001, when you set up your own label under your own name. It was very entrepreneurial. How, it was very entrepreneurial. You're now designing for more than one house. So we're going to talk about yes. how you spread and allocate your time. Well, today I time. do 16 clothing collections a year, maybe a few more. 
And, and how do you allocate your time? How do you actually allocate your own energy as Zach, the human being? Um, well, there is not much time to allocate uh, in there. Um, it changes weekly and daily. Uh, there's a great deal of discipline. This is about being a long distance runner. Uh, I've learned now, I would say in my career as owning my own business, how to be a good leader. And how you are a good leader is you have to learn how to delegate, how to trust, and how to know when your hand and eye comes into a process. Uh, I feel very fortunate to collaborate with incredible teams, and that has taken what I think a lifetime so far of a company to find that balance, to find one's own security in their creativity and their vision, to have that trust. Uh, I am, you know, by nature, a very involved, hands-on control freak. But you don't have the ability to find the balance between art and commerce and growing a business, still with the beliefs and the needs of the commercial market. Because I am quite bipolar in that way. I have art and commerce in me. You, you, and you, that's, I think, one of the biggest things needed today is it's that you have to be a businessman as well as a creator. You in need order to be to a businessman. You need to yeah. understand that. And I got that training later from my business partner, uh, you know, who is a very diversified investor. Fashion is not the first kind of, that's not his main stake business. But he believed in me. And the, and the first person that came into my company was Puff Daddy quite unexpected, so I lived hip-hop world through my 20s. What do you mean that he came into your business? Well, he, he came in and took an equity stake in really? my company. Did I know that? I didn't know I didn't know that, know that. the okay. hip-hop days. Is he still called Puff Daddy? I Very. don't know what he's, he's called. He's on tour. Okay. Bad so boy he on tour. And invested. He did, and at that point, you know, so anyhow, I had my first, I came back to New York for a summer. There was a, you know, at this point, press had started while I was at school here and I knew this that this thought that opportunity is not a lengthy visitor I said let's just go with it and the New York Times did a huge piece uh, three pages in the fashion of the times and is that where they called you a genius and then Stephen Colbert the other day said oh it's very few of us can call ourselves a genius but they yes, called you a genius Child they did genius. in a headline right you know which is like the kiss of death <laughs> I'm, I would be happy and, with and that. It, it, I mean, it was a biased dress that I got destroyed at at school. That I had been, that was a muslin for Naomi Campbell, who I had met while I was in London and really started doing fittings with and was a great supporter. Um, so there were Barneys and Julie Gilhart, the fashion director at the time, came to London to see the pieces I was making. I was shooting fashion TV. Simultaneously, we had a project at school a competition for an exhibition called Curvaceous here at the Victorian Albert. And uh, my dress was one of the finalists and ended up you know, being in the collection on display for many, many years and is in the permanent collection here. And, and that's, that's kind amazing. of where it all came together. And Which is why it's so nice to have you here today. I'm so honored to be here. I've never been in this completed. room. But it's my, really one of my favorite museums in the world. I mean, I would love to get locked in here. I'll, I'll hide behind a sculpture <laughs> at night and then, you know, and hope that the night never ends. Yeah. You know, rest and retire in the museum. Um, I'm sure they I came back to New York. I had somebody that wanted to business partner with me. Uh, I went on a European collection buying trip with him, which was incredibly informative. So on that trip, I met the great independent retailers all over the world, the, the great and late Mary Louisa. So it kind of touched on this web there, and I came back. Now this is like loud and echoing, but I guess you couldn't hear in the back. Uh, and um, I decided not to go into business with this person, and I asked my mother to read a contract. Um, and I asked my sister to help direct a small presentation for Henry Bendel's, and they said, we want to buy this. And I said, I can't produce this because it's just, you know, excess fabric from like Barrack Street, from like the market stalls that I was making the clothing out of. And I said, let me sketch you a collection. So I went to these shops in Midtown where you can kind of hold a bolt of fabric and say, I'm going to use, you know, a few yards of that, but hold it. And then 9-11 happened. 
in New York. I, I, I live in, on Spring Street, which is in lower Manhattan, not very far from, from, the, from the Twin Towers. And you, we were thought, born, you were born at the Apple Store, I remember, from our Apple Talk. Very right close, on the site. yeah, okay. a block away from the Apple Store, which was my, uh, which was the mail, you know, which was, the, you know, and anyhow, let's see. So yeah, we, so, uh, we thought, what are we doing making something so unimportant as, as fashion and clothing? But the teardown, because it happened during New York Fashion Week, was so intense. And I thought, you know what? My mom and I and my sister thought, you know what? Let's, let's go for it. New York you know, needs this boost in energy right now. It's a real strong, visceral feeling to go and do it. So we put together this small collection. My mother did something very smart. She negotiated that the retailer fund upon order half of the collection. And that was the only way we would have been able to finance starting my business. Uh, and then we got a grant for the second collection. And that was the first big show. It was at a deconsecrated synagogue in lower Manhattan that is quite gothic and theatrical looking. Um, and you know, all of my besties and girlfriends did the show, and it was one of those moments, there was no PR company, uh, and uh, everybody came. Isabella, Anna, Hillary Alexander, Susie. It was a full house, and uh, each girl had a one-page script of who their character was, and it was quite theatrical. Uh, I think the music was a big part of it, which I had asked uh, the guitarist and the songwriter John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers to write for me. And, you know, it was quite methodical and repetitive, but catchy. Uh, and, um, you know, from there it was like an overnight moment. I mean, the energy backstage after the show was probably, un I mean, I've never had a, a, an experience like that, not until later when, when Diddy would be backstage who also raised the energy level or excitement. Uh, when, when Puff Daddy was backstage, was he kind of just hanging out and having a drink? No, 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 he was working. Really? Getting the models hyped, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a whole part of it, that show uh, at like 24. So then I had that show, but there was no financing. I mean, we were living what we, my mother called on air and interns. It was in their living room. We were cutting everything, we would take their minivan and deliver the clothing in boxes. Um, and at the same time, I think people, you know, because I was quite theatrical, quite brazen, people, you know, there was very strong mixed reactions, the work. Um, and then um, I met uh, KCD, and KCD took me on pro bono in preparation for my second collection, but I couldn't afford to do a second collection. And, you know, I think through their connections and through kind of the hype that had been created, Tom Ford underwrote my second show with a non-compete to Gucci Group. And that, that made it possible. I mean, he really, that's, I, for, and I hadn't met him even. That's amazing. I didn't know that either. <laughs> and um, I just think, you know, I can't wait till I have that opportunity at one point to give to, 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 to other young creatives in different disciplines. I mean, that, that is the purpose. Creativity should be shared. Even though we work in an incredibly competitive environment, if somebody has real talent, you want to promote them and support them. It's a, I think creativity is something that should be shared, should be promoted. I think it's as important as sleep, as eating, as making love. I think it's a human necessity, our imaginations. Okay, well, you are so creative, and you're creating this many things. I just want to talk a little bit about Brooks Brothers, oh, which right. is... Yeah, we're back to Brooks. Something that has come... Or two as, Brooks. Aside from your label, you're designing... Well, you've also designed the costumes... Costumes? Outfits for Delta Airlines, which has been a huge deal. Huge. It hasn't come out yet. It hasn't come out yet. They don't look... 2018, I think. It is. The, I think at the end of the summer, early fall, we'll start to see... Yeah. ...moments of it. And, and Brooks Brothers, you do four collections a year. Kind as of. well as Zach Posen, Kind of which eight. Is, Really? It's kind of monthly delivery, but okay. it's big. And how did that come about for a designer like you who has your own brand, and then you've obviously been approached by a lot of people, I'm sure. How yeah. do you choose who to align with? 
Well, I think very smartly, and I, I either chose not to take very large positions at very young ages throughout Europe, in France and in Italy. I mean, or my ideas at that time, at different moments, were too big. Uh, you know, I'll remember like the project I did for Givenchy. It was like too big a concept for, for them at that time um, and different places. Um, well, but then Brooks Brothers came about at a time and I thought this was an incredible opportunity. This is the oldest American clothier, over two, almost 200 years old. And this is the original classics. And the look of Brooks Brothers is so in fashion today and has been so adopted by so many other brands. But this is a vertical retailer. We, we sell to our own stores. We are global. We're in every, you know, a full reach. And I thought there had been this big question, could Zach work in a corporate environment? And, you know, and, and, and we had gone through a period of time when the whole industry and media had turned on me and we had been in a rebuilding process and I thought, you know, like a Yankee doodle, like feather in the hat, let's go for it, let's try it. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it was about a year and a half of building collections before it started going into stores. Uh, but it's classics. It's using all of like an artisanal and make that I have learned over the years, but you know, what we call, I guess, casual wear. I keep calling it sportswear and keep getting on press on this trip, getting corrected. That I'm sports wear it. means you're wearing a very wearing beautiful it. look. Um, but it's you know, very, clean, it's classic, hard. top of class fabrics of the world. But there's a lot of pieces, right? There's a lot of pieces per collection. Compared Huge. To yeah. Enormous. I mean, we have to edit down and focus. You want to focus units in a business so that you have great sell through. I mean, that there, there, there are components to building a fashion brand that are important and essential in, in terms of the business part. It's shoes, it's bags, it's jewelry, it's scarves. Uh, the first thing I thought is, you know, Brooks Brothers has such a great tie business. Well, everything kind of that men have offered there, the best spoke, the ties, well, then we need great scarves. We need to have original artwork. So I enlisted an incredible print designer uh, who works at Hermes and at APC and started creating original print work that would go in cotton. Uh, I enlisted uh, an accessories designer who I'd worked with, Yaz Bouquet. Uh, to do our bags and shoes, um, you know, and it's a, it's, I always say with Brooks Brothers, it was about have, you know, for them, it wasn't about a revolution as a brand, because I would be very disrespectful to the DNA of the brand, which had not been bastardized ever. It was pure. It was a pure brand that just needs, you know, it was about, you know, an evolution, and it's about the customer. It's not about a fashion show. I remember, you know, in the contract, you know, we must have a fashion show, and then we got in as well. We don't want a fashion show, but a presentation's okay. Um, and it's been very informative and inspirational into my own work too. I mean, we then re-brought in daywear into my collection business, yeah. cottons, and and using those in very artisanal ways. I mean, when I came back to New York, what was important was to keep. I realized there was this lack of dialogue of of how you build clothing in America. And for me, working in an artisanal manner with an atelier was essential. And so over the 15 years, we have developed an incredible studio. It's very rare in New York. There are very few design houses, I think, in the world, that, at least in, in, in New York, that, that work in this manner. But it's very hands-on. It's building. I still drape, which I feel that is, you know, that's my ecstasy. When I shut my door, turn on my music, and just play and express, make mistakes. This is what I like about, we're going to talk about tech now. Before okay, we open tech. Up for Q&A, but I like it that you do share that process on Instagram, and you're brilliant on Instagram, and I love it that Thank you're you. sharing. And I've been to your atelier, and you really are there working, and everybody yeah. is there working. So for you, um, how, well, I also, God, there's so much to say. Can I jump around and talk yeah, about the, the Met okay. Gala dress that you sure. just made for Claire Danes, which kind of really encapsulated everything in tech. The theme of the night was tech, but you, you owned the night. How I, I did, really thought I would have more competition. How did, well, to be honest, 
I yeah. really did. I, and I had this moment right. like two nights before at a friend of mine, Uma Thurman's house with a great stylist and, and a fashion director, Elizabeth Saltzman. Yeah, with Elizabeth. You know, and she was, Elizabeth was going through her, her styles. And then I was like, well, this is what I'm making. You know, it was just that moment. And she kind of controlled herself with excitement. Because your ball gowns are amazing, but, but that, that kind of brought, that ball gown went to a new audience because of how it looked. Mm. What was the, how did you come up with that idea? And number two, how does a designer like you choose Claire Danes or someone else? How does that celebrity relationship work? Because we're all fascinated by that Well, one. I mean, what I, I have to start with Judah. I mean, I will start with the celebrity part. I mean, because I trained as a performer and went to like musical theater summer camp, I, I have been immersed with performers and actors throughout my entire life, and I'm very comfortable around them, um, and, and obviously intrigued by I mean, I obviously get it, you know, I get something from that too, and I don't think actors in general, specific people. Uh, Claire and I grew up two blocks away from each other in Soho, and so when I was 16, 17, making frocks for my girlfriends, you know, she, she was, you know, you know, had, had, was a superstar. She had a swing in her loft. I thought, I mean, it was fun. A swing in a loft, it was too cool. And, you know, it was just a, a group, you know, it was a moment in New York in the 90s. And, um, and so I've known Claire forever. She was one of the first champions. I mean, she was at my first fashion show and many of them, um, you know, and then uh, Anna Winter wanted me to take Claire and I was like, she came up with that idea and I was thrilled to bring her. Okay. I didn't know that Anna like pairs everyone around, but that's very interesting. Well, somewhat. I mean, that I yeah. thought it was a real, that's you know, nice. I was so excited, you know, that was great. And then you sit down with her and say, will you be prepared to no, wear no, this no, big no, gown? No, 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 I knew what this. I wanted to make. Okay. I draped it before, um, and I mean, I'm quite nerdy in a way. I mean, I watch my news on NHK, which is the Japanese channel, so there's a lot of tech programs. It's like craft, tech, and then... I like watching the market, the global market, because I like to see the, the Nikki, the Japanese market, open first and then follow it when I wake up in the morning and see how it affects the American market this and then affects my business. Yeah. Um, anyhow, so there's lots of techie programs on there. And I just, you know, I've always, I have a tech side to me. Um, my mom, you know, at different times wanted us to take our brand completely digital. She wanted us to do like create our brand on Second Life. Yeah. You know, all these kind of things, would which I said no to, which probably shouldn't have. Would you consider have. a show in virtual reality Absolutely. if that's something you're looking towards? Of course. I mean, I think yeah. so in some capacity. Yeah. I think there has to be something. I mean, fashion has to be ta tactile. And you can't totally synthesize it, but I'm very interested in digital printing. And before I chose to go to St. Martin's, I had done this crazy math project and to understand, I, I grew up, I could not read. I was totally dyslexic and had ADD. So this has been like this educational like stride to overcome these things, which, you know, now I love to read uh, and mathematics. But I took an experimental mathematics class and I ended up winning a bronze place in the New York State math competition off fashion. Amazing. You know, and I think partially because it was a cool project and part, but very tech and, and, and creating a whole algorithm to how to kind of wire frame the body and print it out. And, um, and the Claire Danes dress, how did Claire you Danes, know? Claire Danes, it's fiber optics. How, yeah, how did you know about the, I mean, we, how did you know that that was available? Where did you find that fabric well, and I Googled. get that idea? Literally, <laughs> okay. I Googled, you know, I had lots of ideas. I was trying to think, you know, for a while I'd wanted to do a fully 3D printed gown. That was something I'd been interested in, but I didn't think it was appropriate for Claire. And, you know, how to combine tech. Well, you can combine something that moves, something that can disintegrate. I mean, there's all kinds of ways, you know, on these tech programs I watch, you know, which, you know, in Asia, you're watching fully animated humans. I mean, I don't think it's that far from the future. Yeah. Uh, we will be able in the future to just take a brain and have a computerized body, and your brain will be able to be sustained forever. We can have an avatar of you here. We, you know, you will be able to live forever if you choose, in a way. As a mind, I don't know how sick that mind will grow over centuries, but it's possible, not yours, just in general. <laughs> um, and a dress like that. So anyhow, it was fiber optic. It was like fiber optic, if you could imagine a, a silk file. 
So like three microscopic fiber optic threads, which is basically just a clear plastic filament, and then some silk fibers in between. So it's quite soft. I imagined her with like a battery pack all down her head. No, 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 no. So the whole dress was hollow. I mean, the understructure itself, in a way, for a moment, I wasn't sure if it was going to get as uh, princessy as it needed to. But once I knew Claire was my date and very happy to take her because it was like, you know, a reunion with her and her husband. And, and because she, she's shooting Homeland all the time, I just haven't had time. We hadn't had time to actually spend a quality evening together. Um, so it's, it's, it's hollow underneath the understructure. And it was quite modern, the understructure. And then underneath that is a little hoop skirt where all the filaments that collect on the selvage edge go into a wire in a box about yay big that you know, had an LED in it. So there were a bunch of batteries in there. They lasted around 10 hours, but they weren't on her skin, and it they're really not warm. It really is like Cinderella having to get home before the lights go out. It, well, we were, I was nervous. I thought, oh no, what if like, her left hip goes out? Or, you know, all of a sudden her right boob is out, or <laughs> she leans the wrong way. But, you know, we had practice, and it was really, it was actually my most seamless Met Ball experience of building a dress. It was so easy. Um, and, and uh, you know, I did some, one thing I did very smart was, which I had never done before, which was to order a caravan, a carriage. This was my other question. How do you get her there? You order a Mercedes-Benz carriage. Okay. Big box. She kind of stood. Then we figured out how she could stand in it. You know, because enough the, champagne. The, because the last year, the year before, you also took five girls, four girls, in the most incredible huge Oh, for the Charles James? I think like 13. James. Did you go in a lorry? Did you come in the no, 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 no. With that, who did it? With Charles James, it was Dita Von Teese. Yeah. So she had to like lean like that, because okay. it was the Dita corset, which we have in our studio, which, you know, if, you're, if you want that look in our studio, we have a corse, corset, I love corsetry, so, um, you know, that is comfortable, but really gives you that hourglass you know, silhouette, it's like a, a corselet, I would call it, because it doesn't, it's not full. It doesn't go all the way down. You're, you're the only one doing that. I, I just lie on the floor in a town car. Right, Dita. you're on the floor. I love that. That's exactly how it's it should be. It's all about the dress, not a wrinkle. But you are the only, I, I'm lucky I've worn a few of your gowns, and I wore one yesterday in lovely shop on Motcom, which yes. sells your dresses, and it is inside the craftsmanship, and that you don't actually, it's not even tool, it's kind of tech, digital, plastic tool that's underneath mm. that dress. It's not classic netting. No. It's, it's crazy a, it's, and it's, amazing. It's used for blood filtration. Really? Yes. It's microscopic steel well, I that's just coated urge, in plastic. I urge anybody to not only see the pictures on it's Instagram, a wonderful but to store go in and actually examine these clothes. They're yeah. amazing. Yeah, thank you. That's a beautiful dress. I'm, I'm looking at my Apple Watch. Oh, we're out already? No, no. We have time for Q&A now, Good, and okay. we have to allow a lot of time for Q&A. We haven't talked about Project Runway, so if anyone okay. has a question about Project Runway, TV. feel free to ask it. And then just to Hollywood. say, we're going to end on my bossiness five minutes early so that we can just do some Instagram sure. pictures and everyone can come and we have some assistants who are going to do the Sorry, pictures because you. we're mad about social media. Okay. And we want to spread the message and Thank share you. you because it's really rare to have you. So I'm we're so just happy to be. I wish I could corporate. spend more time in the UK. I really, so do we. I really... Um, I just think how, how fortunate you all are to live in a country with such great history and antiquity and uh, today respect for that and, and respect, I don't know, for good, the smart that like gardens yeah. for me are very important, nature is. Well, it's because we have, have so much rain. rain but that's fabulous, why. I mean, I'm so jealous of the roses. Yeah. Even in like small little flats on terraces, you see. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I have one rain in New York and then hot and like my roses get dots in them. Yeah, we are one big garden compared to New York. I think so. Somebody was like, New York has way more outdoor space. I was like, absolutely not. No way. Okay, we're going to open up for Q&A. Um, do you want to choose or shall I choose? Oh, you choose. Okay, I'll choose. If you have a question for Zach, raise your hand okay. and someone from the team will bring you a microphone. And if we can switch the microphones really quickly so that we have time. Lady first here in the white vest. If we can start there and then we'll go up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hiya, thank you, that was really fascinating. My question is, you're one of the 
few designers that really merges fashion and tech like seamlessly. You know, you don't look like a robot, you don't feel like a robot, you can move. Um, going forward, what do you think are the essential skills for other designers to kind of do that as well seamlessly? I think it's very hard and challenging. I mean, our Met Ball dress really could have been a mess. Uh, in many ways. It could have gone too sci-fi just through the cut of the clothing. I think it has to be emotional for fashion and tech, especially if it's high fashion. I mean, I think tech in sportswear will easily be seamless. I mean, it already is there. You know, there, there's all kinds of things in visible tech. But, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, I think that every high-rise building, you know, should be having a film, a transparent film put on the windows that, you know, where you can create solar energy. There are certain things that are just obvious in conservation. I mean, I think you have to be respectful with tech. I mean, tech will take over. Our brains will, we are already training our brains to be digitized. How we think is digital. So you have to keep integrity and process and craft attached to that. And then I think it be can become a magic element. Um, I hope many more designers play with it. I mean, they're great. Hussein Shalayan has played with incredible tech elements. And, and, and I think, you know, you just have to be careful that it doesn't become something that I call, like, really kitsch. Because it can be. But maybe that's good, too. It depends how it's done. There's good kitsch, too. There's good kitsch, Weird too. Weird science. Okay, um, let's go with the lady here, and we'll jump around. Thank you. We'll get there. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering when you were saying that you had to be a businessman, but then also how creativity is important. Then how do you maintain yourself so creative? I mean, you, you, this, in, on Instagram, you show how like cooking with Zag and then so many new things, but then you're also a businessman. So how do you maintain the creativity? Well, the business supports my creativity and my process. So I value it. Um, my business partner, it was essential for him and he made sure of it through tough love. No, you know, and, and um, you learn. It's real. I mean, I really don't believe you can be oblivious to it. Fashion is a business. I'm very respectful of the idea. If you wanted to be a designer and say, I'm just an artist, but then you have to have your expectations in check of what you want to be. You'll never be a giant brand as this. You know, it takes more than that, and it, the cost of making clothing um, it's such a luxury to build things in an artisanal fashion and to be creative. So the business part, you have to think of business. The big picture of building business and making a plan has to be as creative as designing a piece of clothing or inventing it. Because there's no model. Every model is different in a business model. Um, but at the end of the day, there is one, like, like the sun comes up and the sun comes down for now, uh, there's profit and there's, you know, and there's loss and there's margin and there, there, this is the component of it. What goes into a garment, how you're not losing. How many do you need to sell to make it worth making that piece? How many hours go into it? You know, the whole process through, it's important. What is distribution, you know? And then there's like, you know, kind of fashion war strategy when you look at it globally, like planning, distribution, sales point, refills of orders, chargebacks. It's a, it's a screwy business, you know. I've, I've just recently embarked on a, some form of a film project, we'll see. But I'll tell you that the film business is the only business that it seems more weird and screwier than the fashion business, uh, just in terms of, of how it's set up as a model. And, um, you know, if you're able and fortunate to work in the fashion industry, you have to find your comfort place within it. You know, what, what drives you? Is it about being part of a team? Not everybody is, is ready to be the face of their company, to be the business side, and to be the creator. It takes a great deal of resilience. Business is about, you know, continually waking up and having that drive to go forward. You can't get hung up on, on small things that, that will take you aside on your course. But I, I'm all about art for creation's sake too. But I think you have to be realistic that it will not take you to, that, to the next level. You must have an ability to be some form of a song and dance person. 
I mean, even Amicia Prado, who is the reclusive artist, is so in touch with her brand and is such a performer. Again, it's art and commerce, equal it is. balance. Yeah. That you and I mean, the play. art world itself, the fine art world, has become this as well. It's on a financial schedule. Uh, it's not the values, per se, that my father or my family was raised in, so I'm a reaction to that in a way. You know, I figured, okay, I'm going to support my creativity. Okay. We have to, I just, there's a few more because we're running out of yeah, time. Yeah. And we, yeah, okay, great. Oh, can we have the microphone? Sorry, wait one second for oh, the microphone. Mike. On that note, cooking with Zach. He, ha he has a cookbook coming out next year. I know that's a secret. Patience. That's my not secret. secret. We're looking forward. Isn't it a secret? It's okay, a great. Secret. Okay. Hi, I wanted to just first say thank you for designing clothes for grown ups. Um, I think that more and more it's getting a little top shoppy with everybody trying to look like they're 16. I'm not interested in, and, and, in the and ageism I, at all. To I, me, age is beauty. Yeah, and I, I really wanted to, and, and, and Anna, Anna and Pat Cleveland, was, yeah. that was a great stroke. Um, really, as you were talking about business and commerce, it seems as if the industry is leaving a great many people out of the, the ability to even spend money with the top size in most designer clothes coming down. It used to be an American 14, 12 was the top size. Now it's coming down to 10. Um, so if we really, really want to talk about commerce, when the average size, I believe, in the UK is 14 or 16, and in America it's a 14 or 16 or whatever. You mean the size difference the, or just that size? No, that, that most women are larger that than... That fashion the, is that, physically shrinking. Yeah, yes, the fashion size. is physically shrinking. Uh, and particularly well, the, body, the, the body age and the ideal body, if you walk through this museum, what is considered beauty evolves over time significantly. What is the ideal body type, what is considered sensual or sexy. However, I don't understand, uh, and I can't address for the whole industry, why there's odd issues with size, except that, you know, when you go from something that, from a body that, that and I love, I, I first I start, I adore bodies. I don't have these weird issues that I think are very bizarre and strange about size, about race, about age. To me, what makes our world beautiful is that we are each one of us different in DNA. That is exciting to me. Um, the, size, the size issue at retail, I think, is because there is less and less room for investment from a retailer. That's the reason. You know, so when I did David's Bridal and Truly Zach Posen, we were able, one of the reasons I did it is it was accessible and we were able to go up to size 32 at the right price point, US 32. That was essential for me, important. If I had the ability, we would be able to make any, I mean, I don't have, you know, I think there's guidance. Some things look good on some types of bodies, some things don't, that's just reality, but that's how you wear something. That's confidence, that's attitude, but sure, there are shapes, some things work and some things don't. You can't be everything. Um, but that's really the issue from a retail standpoint, I believe. And then I think there's probably some people who do have very ideal body types as designers. I think that why my clothing maybe is different is I drape. It's three-dimensional. It's not a sketched idea, cookie-cuttered into, you know, and then and produced. And, and I think three-dimensionally, and I think about form and curve. Uh, I don't know, I love life. <laughs> Vitality. Okay, I love that answer, and I love that I'll question. Answers, Thank you. Lady in the white top with a hand up, and then we'll go really quickly just on this side. Thank you. Sorry it's so warm in here. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm just interested to hear what, like, I was interested to hear you say about Parsons. Um, I'm from New Zealand, so sorry about the accent. Um, but... It's really hard and at home, I'm not a fashion designer. Um, I didn't go to school at all. Um, I actually <laughs> learnt randomly off Project Runway and books and teaching, Yay, teaching cool. myself, so thank you. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to know like, what your advice would be to those of us who are really self-taught, because I find at home it's really hard to break into the fashion industry if you don't have the credentials. Well, what do you want to break into in fashion? Well, do you I want mean, to get a job or do you want to be your own designer? <laughs> I think for me it would be, you, you don't really have the chance to actually work for any of the local fashion houses. Um, 
there's a big gaping hole in New Zealand in the accessories market, and it's really hard to sort of break into that market. You'd have to. Then you have to own. be pretty. Yeah, you'd have driven, to be, and yeah. you have to use the tools yeah. we have today with social media. Yeah. To get your point of view across, and it, you know, and and make something that does catch people's attention. And do I mean, you think that PR and Instagram and obviously like all of that sort of business side of it is the most important sort of way to, you know, is that sort of where you see the thrust of, of somebody like me who's very, very small <laughs> and one person? Well, I think it's helpful. I yeah. don't think it's the only way. I think word of mouth is yeah. most essential. Dress your girlfriends <laughs> or boyfriends. <laughs> I don't know. Me, I've been Get people <laughs> out wearing it. Are you wearing what you made? Um, no, I've got a... Top no, 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 no. You need to be wearing yeah. what you made. I've got it with me. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Every day. Okay, yeah, gotcha. you are your best advertisement. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Next talk, we'll see you in your own tops. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the lady behind, can you just pass the microphone behind yeah. you? We can Thank move you. faster if we... Mic hop. Yeah. Hiya, I'm Rosie. Um, my degree has absolutely nothing to do with fashion, but I've decided that I want to go into costume designing and I'm going to be doing a week-long course at Central St. Martins. And then I also have a bit of a fear for the sewing machine. So I hope this isn't too broad of a question, but do you have any advice or any people I should go talk to at Central St. Martins and sort of like name drop you to them? <laughs> I, I don't know who teaches the costume department. Yeah. It's, I didn't even know there was a costume department at St. Martins. Um, I don't Just think... name drop his name everywhere you go. Yeah. It will get you somewhere. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I don't know. Go to go. I would did an internship at Angels. Yeah, I've I've sort of like badgered them with my CV. Just and go. My name. Just I mean, keep going. Sketch it. <laughs> Instagram there. Yeah. Make. I mean, what I would do if you're interested in costume is prolifically make inspiration books. Okay. For sure, Hun yeah. You know, when I was living here. You know, just books. You know, there's so much paper in this yeah. city, <laughs> and print. I mean, there's a great city of prints and liter you know, and even off prints that are lower price and postcards. I mean, make your story. Yeah. And find what your individual point of view is, and that isn't going to happen right away. That's going to develop. Yeah. <laughs> you keep creating that. I mean, if you just strictly want to do period pieces, then it's finding what is your texture, your coloration of that. You know, because even when you see something, there is a very strong design point of view to historical costume and how it's reproduced. Yeah. Okay. Um, spend a lot of time in museums. I yeah. mean, live in them. Yeah. Really. I mean, that's for costume design. <laughs> and My then... advice would be go clubbing, because I interviewed Sandy Powell <laughs> right here, and Sandy got her first big break in a nightclub, yeah, see meeting what it, a director, I I mean. and get clubbing is what I would and suggest. See, and see, and, and start making them. I mean, figure yeah. out. There's great uh, Macmillan press books with okay, the costume yeah. design. They sell them here. Yeah. You know, where you can get the different structures and shapes, jackets. Okay, we have time. We have Lovely. time for one thank more. You. We're, we're fine. Thank you. We're, I'm, ooh. Ooh. We have time for one more. I'm not, I'm not picking it. Well, I'm going to go to the person right at the back because we've been at the front. So the lady at the back on this side, please. Can we have a Thank question, you. though, if somebody who's, like, interested in... I mean, who's... who's in, at who's, the top. Studies, I don't know, studies fashion. But yeah. it's great. Go for, like, museums, and museums, then, And museums. then we're going to end really quickly and And do film. Quick you should be photos. watching a movie a night. And old movies, though. Okay, good. Just checking. Would you do a movie? Have you been asked to design for movies? Clothes? Uh, I have been. It's time. Time, yeah. Okay, Theater sorry. And movie. I did the Rockettes this year. That was oh, fun. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah, you did the Rockettes. I saw that on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> Hi. So I go, oh, this is loud. I go to UAL too. And I was just wondering, do you think studying in London really shaped your career? Or do you think you would have gone in a similar direction had you studied in New York? No, I think London was absolutely instrumental and formative. One more. Yeah, okay. and then... One more. One more. Oh, so there was a lady next to you who also had her hand up. Will you just pass the microphone? Okay, next person. Great. Oh, this is the last question. Hello, I'm Zach. Seeing. Hi. Uh, we're the PRs for David's Bridal here in the UK. Hello. So we're Hello. <laughs> we're delighted to see you. I just wondered, are there any limitations when you're designing bridal wear? When I design David's Bridal? Yeah. Of course. Many. <laughs> nice. I like that answer. Price, anyway. <laughs> fabrication, technique. We must have a side seam. Um, you know. 
it, it's a learning experience, obviously, as the brand grows. I'd like to have more. I mean, we do like a four to one edit ratio. I don't choose what goes into the store. I did, we design, I collaborate with them, and then the merchants choose it per region, per what sizes go into there, which is hard because it is such a visible big brand. It's done quite wonderfully in the UK, so I thank you. No, it's not as, you're in You and Your Wedding this month, just so you know. What? You and Your Wedding magazine, you're in there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to end and say, having discussed all that we discussed, it just proves to me that you're not only a really nice person, but you're an incredible businessman as well as a really creative person. And that, I really think, shows all of us how much you need to have in order to succeed in the way that you have. I am genuinely your biggest fan. I don't want to be a sucker fan, but I really am. Long may you continue in everything that you do. And it's such an honor to have you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me.